Uh, first and foremost, uh, thank you so much to the Foreign Policy Association. It really is a tremendous honour on behalf of all of us at McKinsey to be here tonight and be honoured in this way. We really do appreciate it. And we are in good company. So to John from Cushman and Wakefield, to Ed from City, uh, we really are grateful to have the chance to be sharing this podium, even if we did have to drop it down just a few inches. Um, I couldn't help but recall Glasgow too, so thank you for the family history. You made my mother proud in doing so, because I did grow up in a city in the 1980s that was a long way from this country. <clears throat> it was a long way in many sense and was going through its own challenges at the time. In fact, it was the years of Mrs. Thatcher's Britain, and there were many, many good things about that, believe me. But they weren't seen that way in Glasgow. <clears throat> we spent most of our time with a great debate going on, a debate that essentially revolved around one school of thought that was the business of business is business, and another school of thought that could be captured in the phrase that was chanted on the campus where I went, Glasgow University, which is, they know the price of everything but the value of nothing. Now, fast forward 30 years, in many parts of the world, we're still having that debate. And that debate has taken perhaps added vigor, added energy, because in many respects, we're going through a period of disruption. And the disruption, of course, has many aspects to it. The shifting global powers and the way in which they are interacting with each other. Consumers, how they're evolving, their attitudes, the way they see the world, the environment and what's happening to the environment. But we're also going through a revolution, a revolution that's an industrial revolution. Not because the technology that grounds that revolution is new. In fact, many of the technologies that are shaping our world today have actually been around for a long time. We have had robotics. They're just better now. We have had the internet for quite a few years. We have had immense computing power, albeit constantly getting even more immense. But what's new is the way in which these have all interconnected, the way in which they've connected up to create an unprecedented degree of change change that is fundamentally impacting the people of this world. And the way they are responding to that change is taking many forms. But there are a few facts worth keeping in mind. The first of which is that not every job is being changed or removed, but 60% of jobs see more than 30% of the tasks fundamentally altered. 700 million people need to be reskilled, And that's an enormous task. And it's a task that business now has to confront. It's a task that we will be judged on as to whether it's completed successfully, because I can stand here and say to you that I have no doubt that tomorrow will be better than today, and that more jobs will be created just as they have in every industrial revolution. But the point is, what will happen on the journey towards that future? And in that disruption, in that revolution, I think lies a lot of responsibility for those of us who've been beneficiaries of change to find ways to contribute. And so for our firm, as we think about the efforts we undertake, that's where we're choosing to focus, to rethink the way in which work is being done, to ensure that we can make this transition peacefully and do so to the benefit of society as a whole. And one of the things I'm particularly proud of is that, for example, we founded an institution called Generation. And Generation has become the largest private sector effort to reskill the youth of the world. It now operates in 12 cities, across 12 countries across the world. We have 2,700 corporate partners who are helping us embark on a program to get young people into work with the skills they need so they don't get disenfranchised as technology runs its course. And that's one example of what I believe corporates around the world need to do. It's one example of what social responsibility now demands. Another example is to find a way to rise above some of the political rhetoric and remain open, open to the peoples across this world. It is, as Ed pointed out, the 75th anniversary of Didi, and I was in London this morning, and watching the BBC News literally recount what happened minute by minute on June the 6th, 1944. And America's role in that is enormous. And the debt of gratitude we as Europeans, and soon not to be Europeans, I guess, if you're from Britain, but we as Europeans feel, <laughs> feel deeply. And so I stand here and I watch that video and I saw it had 1944 in that video. And of course, you cannot help but think of the sacrifices that were made and think of the importance of preserving the international institutions that allow us to have the dialogues, that allow us to know that there is a way to talk, no matter how tough the going gets. 
And that, I believe, is another part of what all of us need to keep and hold dear and hold precious. So as I reflect on the world that I knew in 1989, it's changed enormously. This morning, I was reading an op-ed that my colleague Liz Hilton Siegel had written along with one of my other colleagues, Lorena Ye, which talked about the impact of automation on women and the reality that many of the jobs that are most likely to be impacted are held by women, disproportionately so. Recognizing also that women undertake a lot of the unpaid work that goes along with the paid work. And if you think about the journey that we now need to go on, you would not be surprised to know that one of the other areas where, I have, where we as a firm are very focused is on how can we contribute to addressing this challenge, to making sure that the women of this world have the same opportunities and don't get disproportionately impacted so that the advent of this wonderful technology that will automate all of our lives doesn't set us back when it comes to the progress towards equality that we still need to deliver. So there are so many places where the business of business is not just business. And much as I believed in that phrase in the late 1980s, I don't anymore. Because we're being judged, we're being held to a higher standard. We, our firm is being held to a higher standard. I'm acutely aware of that. And there are several reasons why. One is because we represent the elite. Maybe not from Glasgow, but we do represent the elite. And the elite are seen as not necessarily a force for good. The elite are seen as mysterious. And if I reflect on my own experience in Glasgow in the late 1980s, I didn't really know anyone from business. Why would I? My father was an academic. My mother was a teacher. And they chose Ottawa in the Canadian winter. So that tells you how they thought about their choices. <laughs> and yes, Glasgow's weather is better than Ottawa in the Canadian winter. <laughs> the tourist board have paid me to say that. But why would I know anything from business? Just as many, many people don't. And so it's so important for us to be out there and making the case for business because it's not going to be made for us. The elite are not valued and liked. We have to find a way to break some of that. The second thing, in an age of transparency, the way we all conduct ourselves has to reflect the realities of the demands of society. I joined a firm where we were so secretive that on the way to a client, we were instructed to make sure that the taxi dropped us at least two blocks away from the client so that no one could figure out where we were going. <laughs> it didn't work so well when you were from Glasgow arriving in London, you had no idea where you were going anyway. <laughs> and you recognize those two blocks meant you just got lost. But the world's got lost. And secrecy isn't valued and appreciated. So being more open and transparent matters. And the third thing, being global. Our firm prides itself on being global. I've lived and worked in a foreign country from day one when I moved to England. I've been in France, I've been in China, and I spent a decade here in Manhattan. And I am so grateful for those opportunities and the fact that when you ask my daughter where she's from, she can't really answer the question. But I can say this, we want to ensure that our firm can continue to be the way in which many people get a similar experience because we believe in the power of understanding what's happening around the world. Which brings me back to where I started in the role of the Foreign Policy Association. Your mission to ensure an informed electorate, an informed democracy, matters more now than it ever did. Because the obstacles to us having a global exchange have got higher and higher. And we have to fight against that tendency. We have to keep the, the lines of communication open. And we will certainly be doing our bit in that regard. But I actually want to close with a reference to an arch capitalist, Adam Smith. Adam Smith wrote a minor work in 1776. I believe other things were happening that year called The Wealth of Nations. But that is undoubtedly his lesser publication. Not just because I actually think it is his lesser publication, but because his best publication was written in 1759 while he was the professor of moral philosophy at Glasgow University. <laughs> the Wealth of Nations was written when he was at a lesser institution down south called Oxford. <laughs> but in 1759, Adam Smith wrote The Theory of Moral Sentiment. And The Theory of Moral Sentiment makes the case for the role of the entrepreneur in society. And it has some wonderful phrases that the role of humankind is to remember the community that the role of the entrepreneur is to enrich the community, 
that when the community is enriched, entrepreneurs are enriched. Let's not forget that. I believe in business. As I look at the St. Regis in New York, the only reason this guy from Glasgow via Canada is here is because of a partnership, a business that gave me the opportunities. Opportunities that businesses around the world create day in, day out, as they create wealth, create jobs, give people hope. That's why the case for business matters. And so in accepting this award on behalf of all of us for corporate social responsibility, I am proud of our philanthropic work. I'm proud of our charitable endeavors. But I'm even more proud of the work we do with our clients that day in, day out, creates jobs, promotes productivity, increases efficiency, makes the economy more productive. Because I think in doing that, we advance the welfare of society. But we have to tell that story because in this age of revolution, and it is revolution, business with a purpose matters more than ever. Thank you to the Foreign Policy Association and thank you very much. <laughs>